Embark on a culinary adventure at Adams Morgan Eats in the Streets on Saturday, July 29th. That's from 1 p.m. to 8 p.m. The event will take place during the launch of the 2023 Adams Morgan Pedestrian Zone. That's the 2300 and 2400 blocks of 18th Street Northwest. Eats in the Streets will showcase approximately 50 neighborhood restaurants and retailers where attendees can sample cuisines from across the globe, purchase meals to go, and enjoy free, free entertainment, including live musical performances. The event is brought to you by the Adams Morgan Partnership Bid and sponsored by Aetna. More information can be found at admodc.org slash eats. That's A-D-M-O-D-C dot org slash eats. Today on CityCast DC, it is hot. And even though we hardy Washingtonians are supposed to be used to that, it is also news because we're looking at ways to deal with our climate future. And if that weren't calamity enough, there is an invasion of some very odd looking worms. But today is not just about the trials the gods are handing us. In the category of man-made disasters, there is an interesting debate afoot about DC's ugliest buildings. There is, alas, a lot to choose from, and I'm here with CityCast's Priyanka Tilvey and Julia Karen, and we have thoughts. Today is Friday, July 28th. I'm Michael Schaefer, and here's what DC is talking about. So, uh, as you may have noticed, because we are all uh, sweating right now, so mm. we have to turn off our air conditioners in order to make the sound perfect and <laughs> city cast level. The sacrifices we make for you all. Yeah. As you may have noticed, it's hot. There is predictions of record-breaking heat through Sunday. It's actually uh, summer-wide. We have fewer 90-plus days than the average but, uh, you know, we are looking at a country that's scorching and a future that is predicted to have more and more of this. Priyanka, what's going on? What's the news piece of this? Yeah, well, I mean, it's the bit you just said, that we're looking at record-breaking temperatures. We're looking to hit above 100 degrees for the first time in seven years. Um, and the heat index, which is like the measure of how hot it actually feels outside when you're factoring humidity, um, that's going to be between 100 and 110. So it's going to be ugly out there. It's to the extent that Bowser has initiated the emergency heat plan, which goes into effect whenever we hit above 95 degrees. The thing that I find most interesting about this is the way that it affects different neighborhoods. Researchers who study the intersection of climate change and community equity do say that there's a strong correlation between historically red line neighborhoods and heat. So basically saying that neighborhoods that have been marginalized and disadvantaged for generations have the worst heat indexes suffer the most from heat-related problems. It's interesting because D.C. that does not appear to be the case. In D.C., our hottest neighborhoods are Ivy City, Trinidad, Columbia Heights, and Navy Yard, at least over the past few years. Those have been the neighborhoods that have the highest heat indexes. And that's because we have a bunch of these, like, quote-unquote, urban heat islands. Do you guys know what those are? No, but I would think that Navy Yard would be cooler because you would get the breeze coming off of the water and that would cool it down. But, like, why is that not the case? That's so weird. Yeah, I know. And I would think that Columbia Heights would be cooler because it's high and and in the heights. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What it really comes down to is the amount of trees in the area. Um, water does also have an impact. So you, it, Navy Yard is kind of surprising, but I think it's because it's so flat out there that the humidity from the water probably outranks the cooling effects from the water. And then with Columbia Heights, we're specifically talking about that area where all the street vendors are, which is terrible for them because they're out in the heat all day, which is just like pavement and buildings and asphalt. You know, it's it's the replacement of trees and coverage by basically paving paradise to make parking lots. That's like the, the impact that um, you get from heat islands. So the best places in our city in that sense are Rock Creek Park, areas near Rock Creek Park, and Anacostia as well, because they tend to have lots of trees down there, lots of single family homes. So they separate it out and you have more greenery and that helps keep the neighborhood cooler. That's so fascinating. So is like the solution here to just plant more trees in areas that don't have more trees? Like what else can we do to not be having our city be a sauna? 
Yeah, exactly. I've been seeing a lot of people on Twitter talking about that Casey Trees tip that we've included on Mm -hmm. our show multiple times, which is that if you call Casey Trees, they will come and plant a tree in your yard for free. Um, And that is something people are talking about a lot in response to this heat emergency that we're in right now. But look, if you fly into D.C. or you just take a walk around, this is like one of the greenest cities. There's huge amounts of park space. It's very tree covered. You mentioned that spot of Columbia Heights on 14th Street that's very pavementy, but that in a lot of American big cities would not stand out. And in uh, in the District of Columbia, it does. One of the interesting things about these lists you mentioned is Mount Pleasant and Columbia Heights, one of them ranked cool and one of them ranked among the hottest of city neighborhoods are right next door to each other. Yeah, it's fascinating. Mount Pleasant kind of yeah. uh, sticks into Rock Creek Park, though. And, you know, that a lot of the things that cause the heat island effect just didn't really happen here. This was not a place of lots and lots and lots of industry where there's, you know, blocks and blocks of factories uh, and uh, parking lots for them and so on. Yeah, no, it's really fascinating. I think that it'd be interesting. I haven't looked into this, but it'd be interesting to see how D.C. urban heat islands compare to other cities, urban heat islands. Like maybe because we have so many trees, the difference between the base level temperature and the heat index is better here than it would be in, say, New York. My sense of Washington, like the rental market, is um, air conditioning is pretty ubiquitous. Um, Mm -hmm. It's not You know, and there's places I've lived where it's kind of like, oh, you rented a place with air conditioning. That's pretty fancy. But the the city has set up, uh, opened so-called cooling centers. Yes. uh, um, For so presumably they 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 are concerned about people who don't have access to air conditioning. What are these things? Yeah. So as part of the heat emergency plan that is now in effect through Sunday, there are a bunch of cooling centers that have been activated. It's pretty much all of the community centers, all of the libraries, a lot of the senior wellness centers, and then a few other public buildings as well. And then another thing to consider is that there's also all of the museums that are great spots with air conditioning. Frankly, I feel like they're sometimes too cold that are also an option during the day to go and get cooled. So look at you multitasking. You get some coolness and you raise your cultural IQ. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know. What else can people do to stay cool besides like just hydrating, like drinking a lot of water, maybe carrying an umbrella so the sun isn't just like beating down upon you? Like, is there anything else that we should look out for? I think the the main thing to be aware of is what it looks like if you haven't cooled yourself down properly, which is heat stroke. So just for anyone who doesn't know, the signs of heat stroke are that you would have a really high body temperature, like when you take it with a thermometer above 103 degrees means that you're probably having heat stroke, red, hot, and dry skin, a really fast, strong pulse, and dizziness or confusion. And the the thing to note with this is that if you do suspect you have heat stroke, do not drink anything. If you think someone around you has heat stroke, do not give that person something to drink. That's not the solution. I know. My mind was blown. You're supposed to cool them down with other methods. So like take a cold water compress and put it on their forehead, get them to a cooling center, get them into air conditioning, but do not give them anything to drink. And obviously call like emergency services. All right. So what if you're really hot, right? And you, uh, you go down someplace like maybe by a river or something and you see a two foot jumping worm. <laughs> There's a, a, a couple new species out there that are new to Washington, at least. What's up with this, Julia? Okay, so continuing in the theme of uh, God sent plagues, you would think it would be snakes. That's not the case here. It is worms. And there's two separate variety of worms. They are both from Asia. People think that they came over because people brought over like plants or something, but they are invasive species. The first that you mentioned uh, is this jumping worm. And I just have to say the nicknames for these worms are great. They include... Alabama jumpers, Jersey wrigglers, wood eels, snake worms, and crazy snake worms. So we're getting close to the snake theme. Like, we're we're approaching it. Very snake-like, so I hear it. Yeah. So these suckers don't get as big as the other ones I'm going to mention. It's actually three different kinds of worms. But basically, what happens is if they get disturbed, 
they will like thrash around and move wildly and like <laughs> jump and like contort and contract their muscles in such a way that they like fly into the air. That's why they're called jumping worms. Sorry, um, just pause real quick. I feel like the listeners need to know that as Julia is describing this thrashing and contorting, <laughs> she is doing so with her body. I'm, I'm trying to contort myself. It's also to cool myself down because it is so hot. <laughs> but yeah, so they jump around in this crazy manner. And the reason that they are bad for the area is that when they eat and when they poop, I know, another podcast where we mentioned poop, prepare for poop jokes. Basically, what happens is they change the soil composition. And so it makes the soil drier, it depletes it of nutrients, and it makes it so that the normal plants and things that would grow there won't grow. And that's bad because you want the stuff in your garden to grow. You can also test out if you have them in your backyard by using a mustard test. And this is using a liquid mustard pour. Basically, you mix a third of a cup of ground hot yellow mustard, so like a Chinese or Asian hot mustard. You want it like spicy. Uh, Into a gallon of water and you pour half of the liquid slowly over a square foot of soil and then a few minutes later, pour the rest. It will basically make all of the worms, including earthworms, come to the surface. Uh, You can identify them, you can collect them, get rid of the jumping worms basically, uh, and the mustard solution won't harm your plants or kill the worms. It just aggravates them. Wait, what do you mean get rid of? What What do you do? contact, you know, your local environmental agency, say, hey, I have them in this plot of land and they will come over and take care of them. I imagine what that means is they'll come over and just like eradicate them, kill them. So there's like a worm squad out there that, that's just, they're waiting for the call. It is like a, like a, like a worm squad. Exactly. Yeah, so we have rat squads, snake squads and bear squads. And now we have worm squads as well. DC is just a jungle. It is a jungle. And speaking of that, If you thought hammerhead sharks were only in the water, (laughs) no, no. The second kind of worm is this hammerhead worm. It literally looks like a hammerhead shark. This is the one that gets to be about two feet long. Disgusting. It is gross. I have seen the videos. I have seen pictures. Uh, This is not like a shy halu dune moment where we are like, the worm is holy. This is a moment where like, you need to get rid of this thing. (laughs) You do not want to touch it. You do not want to bow down to this worm. There had been a couple of sightings recently D.C. had about 16 sightings. Virginia had like 248. Maryland had like 91 over the past couple of years. But what's sneaky about these guys is they contain a tetrodotoxin, which can cause paralysis, which is bad. And they have no natural predators. So basically what hammerheads will do is they'll go around and they'll eat all these little invertebrates. So like earthworms and snails and slugs and kill them. And that is paralysis of all of these prey that they're going after. They do not cause paralysis if they come in Mm -hmm. contact with human skin. So here's the thing. You should not touch it with bare hands. The tetrodotoxin, it's not as poisonous to us as it will be for the invertebrates, but it is poisonous enough that like it is a problem. So the short answer is it causes irritation. And also you could potentially be allergic to tetrodotoxin. That could be bad. If you have a pet, like a dog or a cat or a bird that like flies around and maybe eats little worms, do not have it ingested. Do not have it ingested. That will be bad. The tetrodotoxin could potentially kill your pet. Okay, so how exactly do we get rid of these? Okay, so the way uh, that you get rid of them, one is that they don't like the sun. Um, so you're not going to see them during the daylight. You are probably going to see them more at nighttime. What you should do if you see them, and you're like our sweet, sweet friend, uh, Kevin Ambrose of The Post, uh, who found, like, 14-ish of these uh, in his yard, (laughs) which is wild. What you can do is you can salt them. Uh, And what that does is it draws out the water and the toxin on the skin, and it dries them out. And it makes them delicious. (laughs) Maybe don't eat them, but to each their own, I guess. I don't know. Uh, Do not eat them. Not to each their own. Do not eat them. Don't eat it. And then what you can do is grab it with a plastic bag, and you can freeze them. And again, further immobilize and them. That makes them extra delicious. Exactly. St- <laughs> stick them in a fryer, little little worm snack. It's all good. No, stick them in your freezer and then call animal pest control. Call your local environmental agency. I feel like a broken record, but like leave this to the people who are professionals. Do not do this entirely yourself, please. <laughs> Between the mustard test and the salt, there's a lot of like food preparation involved in killing and capturing these worms. <laughs> yes, there there is. Uh, who knew that mustard and salt were the true commanders of the worm? Uh, all right, so let's talk a second, uh, since we've, we've now declared war on some species, uh, <laughs> to talk about what man hath wrought here. Oh uh, Priyanka found a 
funny debate on on a Reddit about what is the ugliest building in Washington D.C. As it happens, this is a thing I like spent some time with lately. I wrote my political column a couple of weeks ago about a push by this sort of conservative cultural group, uh, architecture group, to uh, forbid anything but quote unquote classical buildings in Washington D.C. Uh, a lot of people think that's weird, and uh, some people find that uh, style a little bit fascist, but. Uh, they have a point, uh, uh, and the point is there is a lot of really hideous, uh, often government or university architecture out there, including in Washington, where the growth of the government coincided with maybe the, the least well-regarded moment in architecture history. So, like, my nominees for ugliest building in oh, D.C., boy. I don't know how you guys feel— uh, but the, you know, I think the education department down there on, on independence, the energy department, uh, not far away. These are just some brutal slabs of buildings. The FBI is probably the most hated oh, uh, yeah. building in D.C. It's, it's a, been it, named the most hated building in the country at some point. Right. And now it's extra hated because it's actually like falling apart and uh, chunks of it are falling off. But, you know, you, you go down to Penn Quarter, a really beautiful old neighborhood, and then all of, and, and everything's vibrant. And then you turn on that block and, and it's it's like literally dark because it blocks out the sky and figuratively because it's just a brutalist uh, monstrosity. I was surprised. I don't know what you guys think, but in, in the popping online debate, a lot of people singled out the HUD building, which is a super Ooh. modernist building, but has a, at least has kind of a unique wavy form. Um, I find it... Uh, you know, inoffensive or maybe even from a distance kind of attractive. I think uh, I've been inside and it wasn't so great on the inside. Um, but I don't know, what, what do you guys think? It's a city where there's lots of uh, uh, lots of architecture sponsored by people who don't have to live in the building. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's uh, often a recipe for, for following bad trends. Uh, do you guys have uh, unfavorites? Yeah, I mean, it was in the thread and I cannot agree more. I hate LaFont. I hate LaFont with a burning passion, (laughs) not just the outside, but the inside as well. I just find it to be the most confusing, ugly, like, mess of a building, LaFont Plaza. I feel like it should be an Olympic sport to try and navigate LaFont Plaza. Like, add it to the 2024 Olympics. If you can get out of LaFont Plaza successfully, gold medal. Let's go. Indeed. Uh, Yeah, I agree LaFont is bad. One of the takes that I saw in the Reddit thread uh, that we'll link to in our show notes was RFK Stadium, and that place is also awful. Uh, there is a reason that people are looking to to blow it up and put a new stay in there. But I think Tristan Navarro mentioned this in our FBI relocation thing. I got to say the FBI building. It's so bad, guys. I, it's not just dilapidated on the outside. The soul of it is dilapidated, too. Like, it's just, <laughs> there's no coming back from it. There's no coming back, you know? Yeah. All of these are brutalist, right? That's true. Right. And I, I would say, like, this is not to defend brutalism. I'm not that into it. There are people who are. But there's also a more recent tendency towards just a lot of kind of unimaginative mm. neoclassical buildings. That, the Reagan building on Pennsylvania Avenue is uh, kind of meh, you mm-hmm. know. And there's something kind of a bummer about, like, just unimaginative rehashings of things. It's a sort of a different category because it's 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 often inoffensive. It's just kind of a, a drag. And I think we do that a lot here. And I think you could also make a case that, I mean, this is like a, a refrain I've had, but, you know, this is the last, I don't know, 20 years, or the 20 years before 2020 were to a lot of ways of looking at it, kind of a golden age of D.C. You know, the population was up. A lot of the stats about crime and economy and so on had, were moving in a positive direction. The city seemed to be bouncing back from years of people fleeing it. And if it was such a golden age, why were the buildings so unremarkable? And, you know, you look at these neighborhoods that have really seen a lot of growth in action, the 14th Street corridor, Columbia Heights, and so on. And it's like the same kind of okay, glassy condo building went up again and again and again and again. And there are relatively few kind of memorable buildings that have gone up in that time, which is weird because most, you know, in most history, you know, the, the golden age of whatever, Rome, was a time when they put up a lot of really cool buildings. Some of the cool ones are like public libraries and stuff, which, which you know, again, they're sponsored by governments who, uh, although they don't have to live in the building they build, they also often don't have to hustle and make the most money out of it, too. 
Yeah, I mean, it's very on brand for DC that we would lean in so heavily to substance over style. That's true. It is true. I mean, look at our Metro, right? Like, the inside of it is Brutalist too. Now, it looks a little better because it's, like, got this coffering yes. with the with the concrete. And, like, that is Brutalism that looks kind of pretty. And I, I would, yeah, I think the Metro is, the, is not substance over style. I think that, yeah. you know, if you look at, like... You know, New York or, you know, cities, Paris, even like where, these cities where they built a metro by kind of ripping up the street, going a level down, putting some tracks in, you know, putting up a new roof, and put, re- rebuilding the street. Those are very uh, useful stations, um, but often not very pretty. In Washington, thanks to geology, they had to go way further down. But then they kind of build this crypt effect. I mean, that could metro in its own way is is really quite beautiful. And they could have done it much more cheap and efficiently, and much less uh, pretty. Are we praising Metro for brutalism? Have have we gone that route? What is happening to us? What an unexpected turn for this episode. I know. (laughs) I know. Dang it, we were here supposed to be talking about ugly stuff, and here we are saying nice things. Exactly. Aw. Well, hopefully we'll take that with us into the weekend. All right, now while you are thinking ahead, here is our tip of the day. We, CityCast, has a live, live taping in one month from today. Priyanka, will you tell us the details of that? Yeah, so August 28th, that is a Monday. Um, It is also the one-year anniversary of us going daily, which was a huge deal for us. Um, And so we're celebrating that. We want to celebrate with all of you. So we're having this party slash live taping. Again, August 28th, save the date. It's happening at Doubles, which is up in the Parkview Petworth area. It's going to be in the evening that day. So pop on over after work. It's going to be a great way to start the week. We're going to have both Mike and Bridget, both of our hosts there, as well as the whole team. And we're going to have some special like celebratory anniversary things going on, which are surprises. So you're going to have to show up if you want to find out. So uh, yeah, save the date. We're super excited. Woo! That is all for today here on CityCast DC. Priyanka, Julia, thank you for being here. Thanks, Mike. Absolutely. Our lead producer is Priyanka Tilve. Our producers are Julia Karen and Elizabeth Kama. Our newsletter writer is Kayla Cote Stemmerman. Our production assistant is Susanna Brown. And our hosts are Bridget Todd and me, Michael Schaefer from Politico. Music is by Alex Roldan. If you enjoyed the show, why not tell a friend, rate the show, leave us a review, and subscribe to our morning newsletter. We'll be back Monday morning with more news from around the city. Bye. We're the Paul Atreides <laughs> of, of this adventure. Who possibly could have known? Uh, a sports reference. I wonder how many listeners will get nope, that. Nope, that's a Dune reference. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>